UW360 is proudly supported by BECU, a not-for-profit, member-owned credit union. Pacific Office Automation, copy, print, workflow, and IT. Problem solved. Hi, I'm Samantha Rund, and this is UW360. Behind me is Susalo Library, the most beautiful building on campus. When construction began in 1923, UW President Henry Susalo envisioned this as the soul of the university. On the exterior, you can see 18 figures representing contributors to learning and culture, including Leonardo da Vinci, Darwin, and Beethoven. In a few minutes, we'll take you inside the famous reading room. But first, let me tell you what we have coming up in today's episode. You'll hear about a prototype for a bionic contact lens that offers a lot more than simple vision correction, and hear about pioneering surgical techniques that save the lives of people with ruptured aneurysms. You'll meet a standout Husky softball player, one, two, three, four, five, one, and a team of slam poetry enthusiasts who compete nationally. We'll take you to Eastern Washington to check out alternative energy sources being developed by the UW and the Yakima Nation. And our first story is about the Dream Project. It was a grassroots program started by UW students to mentor low-income high school students, helping them achieve their dreams of going to college. Today, the project is studied by educators across the country. Studying at the University of Washington campus is a dream come true for freshmen Vansika Sun and Rahul Mehan. The odds of them making it here and getting through the tough rigors of college were stacked against them, considering their background. But a small, growing program on the UW campus called the University of Washington Dream Project is helping hard-working students like Rahul and Vansika succeed. No one in my like, family went to college or even finished high school. So having a dream project was a big help. I'm like, I knew nothing about college or about applications. And I had to do it all on my own, which is really tough. And since I had like no money to pay for college, I like worked one on one with a mentor at Dream Project and she gave me a list of scholarships and I applied for thirty five scholarships my senior year. Are you just looking for scholarships? Just a year later, Vansika is doing the helping. She's one of hundreds of Dream Project mentors. The Dream Project matches UW student mentors with high schoolers who need help with their college applications. It sounds almost like clerical or administrative help, but invaluable lessons happen at these weekly sessions. I mean, in high school, it's kind of easy. You could like pull it up because you know just have a good relationship with your teacher. In college, it's way hard. Like, there's no way you can make anything up. In just one short year, Rahul has also come a long way. We met him back at his alma mater, Ingram High School. It's my reach, my number one. Number one school, blah, blah. Yep. When Raul started at Ingram in 2008 as a high school junior, he could hardly speak English. So what you working on? His immigrant parents couldn't help him with school, but Raul dreamed of getting into the University of Washington. He couldn't believe it when he got in. I didn't know anything about college applications. They helped me, and now it's my time to help others. Because this is how you recruit people. If you, if you got help, it's your time to help others. The vulnerable high schoolers are open to the help because Raul and Vansika can totally relate to them. I have parents that are never home. They're always working. And I have a sister that's always at school, so I really can't find any extra help. So um, having the tutors and going through Dream Project was definitely helpful. So we only have three more visits, so make sure that you, you're wrapping things up. The Dream Project started in 2005 with a handful of volunteers. Today, the Dream Project has hundreds of student mentors signed up. UW students who want to be part of the Dream Project can take a two-credit course. While the high school application process is the main purpose of the Dream Project, it's also helped the student mentors build a much-needed support system. We know the numbers of the percentage of kids from first-generation backgrounds, low-income backgrounds, who start at universities and then, for a million different reasons, family, finances, and others, can't seem to persist to complete their degrees. 
We've been watching Dream Project kids make their way all the way to graduation. But it's one thing to say, oh, we have stories of all of these things happening. It's another thing to be able to prove with evidence, with research, that it does indeed happen. So we are now Im immersed in evaluating our program. <laughs> Raul and Vansica study long hours to stay on track. Vansica only got two of the 35 scholarships she applied for. So she's always juggling studies and work. Vansica says being a UW student is better than she ever imagined. She wants to be a teacher one day. This is a huge dream and like giving so many opportunities like scholarships and just getting help on everything it means a lot and I'm glad that I get to help high school students as well. The Dream Project helps thousands of students every year and partners with 16 Seattle area high schools. It's been so successful that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has invested nearly a million dollars to expand and evaluate the program. For information on volunteering, donating, or participating in the Dream Project, you'll find a link on our website, uwtv.org slash uw360. Now in our next story, University of Washington researchers are creating contact lenses with embedded microscopic displays that will beam information directly to the person wearing them. The ultimate goal of our project is to integrate antennas and sensors and readout electronics onto a contact lens. Students and researchers at the University of Washington are creating contact lenses that can do a whole lot more than just help you see better. So we're trying to convert uh, contact lenses from relatively simple pieces of uh, plastic or polymer to a functional system, something that may even someday resemble in terms of complexity your cel cellular phone. The dot in the center here, this is an LED. The idea here is that we've got a metal antenna that's fabricated directly on the lens and the antenna picks up radio frequency energy that's transmitted by an antenna elsewhere. And the chip it harvests that energy and transforms it into a voltage that can power the LED. Dr. Babak Parvez believes one day these lenses will be able to transmit important medical information like glucose level readings directly to your doctor. The medical information gets transmitted out of a small radio that is placed inside the contact lens. Right now the radio is always on and sends out the sensor readout, but in the future the researchers plan to control the medical information readings more closely. The electrical engineer is also working with his team to create a display on the lens that will transmit information directly on the lens. Information will appear in front of the user as if it's suspended in air. This display can be turned on and off. In your daily life, you deal with a lot of displays. You wake up in the morning, there's an alarm clock that shows you something that has a display. Then you may have a TV in your living room in the morning. That TV has a screen. During the day, you um, work on your computer, on your laptop, on your cell phone, you see many, many screens. Uh, they may be unnecessary, actually, if the screen is just your contact lens. The goal sounds far-fetched, like something out of a science fiction novel, but laboratory tests have been promising so far. We have actually developed uh, contact lenses that now do things. Uh, we have sensors on contact lenses that can measure glucose. We have put light sources and radios and antennas on contact lenses and demonstrated that you can actually turn on these very, very small uh, pixels and display components. Parvis credits a lot of the initial success with the lenses to other UW researchers who are participating in the project. This requires electrical engineering and actually multiple different types of expertise in electrical engineering, very close collaboration with ophthalmologists because the biology of the eye and what happens on that surface is of paramount importance to this project. This has been one of the privileges of being at the University of Washington because the university is, is very, very nicely set up to enable these types of cross-disciplinary collaborations. Engineering students like Andy Lingley know this could be a long haul, but the breakthroughs are exciting. This is pretty huge, actually. <laughs> Because there's a lot of different things that need to come together to make sure that uh, this device is going to work. 
Parvez believes the world will be focusing on the UW one day for this revolutionary breakthrough. I think this is a very promising field. We're definitely at the cutting edge of technology. And yes, it's happening in the state of Washington, at the University of Washington, in Seattle. Next up, Husky softball shortstop, Jen Salling. By her teens, Jen Salling was a rising softball sensation on Canada's national team. Heading south to play for Oregon State, she became an All-American and Pac-10 Player of the Year in her first NCAA season. Good at University of Washington head softball coach Heather Tarr took notice and recruited Jen for the Huskies that same year. Jen brings a lot of passion a lot of experience from playing in the international game, um, just playing the game of softball her whole life. And it was just the kind of experience the young but talented UW program was missing. 2009 National Championship goes to the dogs. We won the National Championship in 2009. Um, last year we were in the running again, the World Series. Unfortunately, we were two and out. Good uh, advice, Pete. <laughs> Where's the bus? Coach Tarr, who had twice missed the opportunity to win at this level back when she was a Husky player, finally getting there as a coach meant that much more. Personally knowing how it feels to lose in the national championship game when the Washington softball program finally won the national championship in 2009, it was a pretty good, satisfying feeling. Even after all the success they've had, Coach Tarr and Salling are more concerned with the team and the sport itself than winning games. It's not about me really. I just love what my teammates can bring to me and how they make me better. I love everything about softball. Uh, I love the coaching aspect. I love developing leaders on teams. I love developing teams. She knows the pitches that she can hit and she's not going to swing at no other ones that she can't. Now in her senior year and with Coach Tarr as a mentor, Jen is looking at the future looking down a similar path. I want to coach. I cannot see myself getting away from the game anytime soon. I see in her a lot of things that I think I can look back on myself as a player. Throughout her career, she's become the kind of player who makes her teammates better. When you're able to compete with your teammates and hold one another accountable, then that's when things get really good. And over the years, she's become the kind of leader it takes to be a coach. She's the first one to want to say something when she sees a young lady that's trying to learn the game. Let's make the players for you, Washington Huskies. I think I want to experience the pro league for a little while and see how that works out for me. Then after that, I think I'm going to go back to the whole coaching route. I feel like I was just, I don't know, born to be around the game for a long time. For a schedule of Husky softball games, you'll find a link on our website, uwtv.org slash uw360. And when we come back, we'll tell you about life-saving surgical procedures at the UW Medicine Vascular Surgery Center. When an aneurysm ruptures, there's very little time to seek help. Even those who are rushed to the hospital may not be saved. At Harborview, the UW Medicine Vascular Surgery team developed a technique that has increased survival rates significantly. My birthday was on June the 28th, and I went to work the next day, and uh, when I got to work, I had driven to work, and I got out of the car, and I had a pain in my leg. Ralph Dockman didn't know that an aneurysm in his abdomen had ruptured. He began to bleed to death internally and collapsed in the parking lot. A colleague called 911, then called Ralph's partner, Andrea. I was at work, sitting at my desk, and I got a phone call. Um, some person had found Ralph in the parking lot. An ambulance sped Ralph to Harborview Medical Center and into the hands of vascular surgeon Dr. Nam Tran. When he arrived here, he was quite sick. He was on the ventilator, had a tube in to help him breathe because he was unconscious. His blood pressure was low because he was actively bleeding. I do remember them picking me up and putting me in the ambulance, and then everything kind of like faded out. Ralph's aneurysm was in the abdominal section of his aortic artery. An aneurysm is a dilating of the blood vessel that occurs when an artery wall weakens, causing it to swell outward. When the pressure becomes too great, the aneurysm ruptures. The result can be catastrophic. 
the way that I would look at ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm is that it is a major insult to an individual. It's, it's similarly to have to be severely injured in a in a war to get shot and is, you are bleeding out. Ralph survived in part because he was taken to Harborview Medical Center. New techniques pioneered here have significantly lowered the mortality rate for patients like Ralph. Three years ago, we here at Harborview Medical Center implemented a protocol for managing patients with ruptured aneurysms using minimally invasive techniques, the endovascular procedures. And we were able to reduce the mortality in half, to cut it in half, for the first time in 30 years, in three decades. Using this minimally invasive technique allows the vascular team to control bleeding before putting the patient under general anesthesia. When patients present to us in hemorrhagic shock, they have bled into their abdomen, they're in pain, their muscles are tense, their blood vessels are clamped down, and those patients come into us in a very, very tenuous state, uh, and their, their blood pressure is very low. When we bring those patients into the operating room, if we, in the past, we would, uh, we would prep the patient awake, and then we would look over the screen to the anesthesiologists, and we would say, okay, go ahead and put him to sleep. And as soon as the patient was induced, he would lose that protective reflex, those protective mechanisms, and the abdominal wall musculature would relax, and the patient's blood pressure would plummet. Uh, down into the 20s and 30s and sometimes to nothing. And it was a mad rush to, to enter the abdomen and to get a clamp on the aorta and try and resuscitate that patient and get them back. Now, without any anesthesia or just some mild local anesthesia, we're able to bring those patients into the room, keep them awake, place a needle and a catheter into the artery in their groin, and go up with an aortic occlusion balloon and just simply inflate that balloon, much like placing a clamp on the aorta. The vascular team successfully performed this technique on Ralph, followed by open surgery to close off the aneurysm and repair the aorta. And the thing that actually gave me the most satisfaction for what I do, and the reason why I do this on a daily basis, is patients like him. He comes in, he's essentially with dying, you're able to help him. What is this place that And when Ralph on? woke up, his partner Andrea was there. I still remember the way she was looking at me when I first uh, started to be, come around to consciousness after surgery. And that look of relief and a smile on her face. And she just looked like, oh, he's back. Welcome back. <laughs> yeah. Throughout his experience in ICU and at Harborview, I recalled how much I love him. I fell in love with him all over again. And the fact that he was able to come back to me from where he was. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Is just amazing to me. I wouldn't be without him. For more information, you'll find a link on our website, uwtv.org slash uw360. And our next story is about biofuels. The UW is working with Washington tribes to develop energy sources from natural resources such as logging waste and wind power. From the lab to the lumber yard, University of Washington researchers are helping make fuel out of forest waste. We call our program Bioresource-Based Energy for Sustainable Societies. Through a grant from the National Science Foundation, doctoral students in engineering and forest resources partner with Native American tribes, developing use of sustainable resources for energy production. Steve Rigdon is both a student in the program and a manager at Yakima Power, a Yakima Nation utility. The Yakima Nation through Yakima Power are looking at opportunities to use egg waste, mill waste, forest waste as a renewable energy source for biofuels. Sawdust and other wood waste can be burned to produce energy, replacing some of the fossil fuels used to run the mill. Elsewhere, agricultural and forest waste can be ground up for fuel as well. Benefits for tribes include new jobs and revenue from selling power, a cleaner environment through replacing fossil fuels, and support for forest restoration with fewer uncontrolled forest fires as logging debris is removed. We always are looking for the triple bottom line, which is in the environmental impacts, the societal impacts, and the economic impacts of our work. 
Societal impacts involve the mark that renewable energy options leave on the landscape. For example, Yakima Power is building a wind turbine demonstration site so the tribe can assess both the aesthetic and cultural effects. And the University of Washington is there to help with all the options. The students are working with absolutely the best facilities and equipment and faculty to answer really important far-reaching questions. It's creating a sustainable energy option with the existing infrastructure, the multi-resource ecosystem services that the Yakima Nation and our neighbors really want to see coming out of their forests. A treasured sign of spring here on campus is the display of cherry blossoms. Photographer Katherine Turner put together a close-up look for us. If you'd like to see that again, or any of our stories, go to our website at uwtv.org slash uw360. And when we come back, you'll meet a talented group of young poets. Welcome back to UW360. You've been seeing the well-loved reading room at Susilo Library behind me. Here's a close-up look at some of the details. The oak bookcases are topped with a hand-carved frieze showing native plants of Washington State. And at each end of the room is a hand-painted globe with the names of explorers such as Henry Hudson, Marco Polo, and Hernando Cortez. The motto at the South End says, books are to be read with imagination, that their wisdom may interpret events and their ideals inspire worthy action. And that brings us to our next story. Since 2006, the university has chosen a book for all incoming freshmen to read. This last year it was You Are Never Where You Are, a collection of poetry selected by faculty, students, and staff. Members of Manic Mouth Congress, a slam poetry group in its second year on campus, participated in the selection, and they do much more than that. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, Just like any team, they have to get a good warm up in before starting practice. Practice to prepare themselves for the College Union Poetry Slam Invitational, aka the Collegiate Nationals, taking place in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Started only last year, the student organization Manic Mouth Congress is led by a small group of officers including Shelby Handler and Katie McCorkle. Erica, thank you for suggesting yourself. Their volunteer coach is Rose McKayles. Manic Mouth Congress is a literary arts organization in a loose sense of that word. It's based on the UW Seattle campus, so its focus is for college students. My grades have changed without me. In addition to providing a home for those interested in poetry, storytelling, or songwriting, their main function is to sponsor weekly open mics and poetry slams for the student body. It's death by seduction and everything's oversweet. I Bringing slam to a group of people who might not otherwise have been exposed. Because I'm not angry. And Slam, there's performance behind it, there's comedy behind it, there's puns, there's rhyme, there's kind of a hip-hop element. Got me feeling like a kid in the candy aisle. Slam poetry is both performance and writing. It's equal. Did you see the sky today? I mean, did you see the sky today? Because I didn't, and I want to know what it looks like. I think competitive art brings out the best in my work and performance and forces me to go to a different level that I normally wouldn't want to share with people. And then I just keep running, biking, swimming, dancing, running, running, running. But for others, slam poetry is also a way to share the darker side of poetic inspiration. Sylvia, I know how you feel. Wrapped in myself like a spool, I know the burden of overactive tear ducts. Cracked lungs squeezing tight on air tubes like go. wrangled hands of a child gripping roller coaster handles. Mm. And doctors who say, it's just stress. Girls, what? It's true. Before slam poetry, that stress was caused by Erica's shyness. A lot of what comes from being shy is not knowing what to say, but in poetry, you know what you're saying. You just have to say it well, and then people are supposed to understand you. 
that. For David. Oh, no. <laughs> Getting the world to understand him as a computer science major, ROTC student, as well as slam poet is the challenge. People have these uh, notions of like what kind of behaviors and activities go together. Um, and I, I find that kind of limiting. Even if they're not playing tooted and booted or teach me how to Dougie, they are playing your song. And I'm you can't deny he's both a poet been. and a performer. If you like all of us, then you should come to the Slam Team send-off show before we go to nationals in Ann Arbor. For Shelby, a veteran Slam poet since before college, competition can easily become the focus. But what's even more important is the group's mission. Our phrase is, you belong here, and so our main platform is the open mic series that we lead on a weekly basis, and so every week we're giving people a space to test out their work, to get feedback, to say what they need to say, while also being challenged to improve their crafts. Yes, we all crave to be worth someone else's time, but you use war like collateral for your curves. All within a safe environment where the sharing of underrepresented ideas is highly encouraged. There are a lot of pretty girls out there, Helen. For me, that has a lot to do with issues of sexuality and a lot to do with issues of like women and the social implications of being a woman and feminism. You didn't want to be another doll in his collection. You wanted to be fought over. I almost understand you. Poetry is awesome. Poetry is what I do every day to remind me where I am and where I want to be. Like we're standing <laughs> on top of the world. <laughs> and that's it for this edition of UW360. You can watch this episode again online at uwtv.org slash uw360, where you'll also find links to more information. Then we'll be back next month with all new stories. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in May.